Good afternoon and welcome to The Full Scottish. My name's Leslie Orr and I'm delighted to be here this afternoon for an hour of conversation about the week's news and events with uh, two very erudite citizens of the world. Uh, we have Ad Anthony Barnett with us. Uh, Anthony is uh, a, he has a long and distinguished career of, of, of engaging with and, and pioneering on constitutional and other political political democratic issues. He's uh, a founder of Charter 88 and Open Democracy, but he's here particularly this afternoon as one of the organisers of the Europe for Scotland initiative, which uh, published an open letter in uh, the press here in the UK and also across Europe. And we'll be talking a lot more about that later on. Uh, we're also joined by Linda Fabiani, who's uh, a retiring SNP MSP for East, Colbr East Colbride, um, and also has served as a deputy presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament. Linda has been a member of the Parliament since, since it uh, reconvened in 1999. Uh, so, a big welcome to you, to you both, and uh, I look forward to our conversation this afternoon. But first of all, I just want to give the, the updated uh, information on coronavirus in Scotland. Since as of uh, 2 p.m. yesterday, Saturday, there have been 175 new confirmed cases of COVID-19. One reported death of people who have been tested positive. 2,811,343 people have received their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccination and 1,263,862 have received their second dose. On Saturday and Sunday, only the headline statistics on new cases deaths and vaccinations are now being updated. Since the start of the pandemic, a total of 1,917,000, no, sorry, <laughs> I'll say these figures are, they're very uh, confusing to me. 1,917,236 people in Scotland have been tested, and of these, 1,691,184 tests were confirmed negative. 226,052 tests were positive, and 760 patients who tested positive have sadly did died and our, our thoughts of course are as always are with them and their family and friends. So let's just uh, continue thinking and talking about about the pandemic and its impact both in Scotland and in the UK and, and globally too. Um, where are we at with, with the, the vaccine programme? You know, this week in Scotland, we've begun to open up a bit more. It's nice to see people sitting out of doors, enjoying a drink in the sunshine, having the opportunity to go and meet family and friends, go beyond our local five mile limits. It's all been very exciting. But, but where have we got to, where, where do you think we are in terms of coming out of the of the pandemic or at least the emergency phase of the pandemic um I'll, I'll i'll speak to linda first and then find out from anthony how how things seem from from a kind of english perspective linda hey uh, thanks leslie yeah it's it's interesting it has been nice to see that things are opening up a bit and it, it reminded me when you said that about uh, how it makes you feel better of a conversation I had yesterday with someone who said that there's a whole psychological thing going on because she doesn't particularly want to go out. Mm -hmm. But the fact that she knows she can has made a huge difference to her sense of well-being. So there's, there's something in that. And it, it strikes me that people are still realising 
that we still have to be cautious and take great care um, because we, we haven't killed this, this virus. It's still there. The vaccination programme is winning the race against the cases from what we can see, but we should never, ever be complacent. But the thing that strikes me most of all is we all tend to live in our, our own bubble of what affects us uh, generally and those round about us, those we care about. Uh, but, you know, this is a global pandemic. It's worldwide. So until everybody in the world Every country in the world is getting on top of this. The rest of us can't be confident that we can get back to life as we knew it. So it's all interdependent. Uh, whether it be, well, we, we've all seen what's happening in India just now. It's, it's just horrendous. So whether it be making sure that we can have generic vaccinations um, and countries producing their own on an ongoing basis um, until we serious about saying what is sensible and cautious about international travel. We have to do all of these things because we all have a responsibility, um, not just for ourselves, but for others and how that affects us all globally. So I am pleased to see that things are getting better here in Scotland, here in the UK, uh, but I have a great recognition that we're only part of a much bigger picture. Yeah, thanks, Linda. Anthony, you know, Linda's used the word caution about the approach in Scotland and that sense that people here are still very much aware of the need to be really careful and to stick to the guidelines um, and, and to recognise and to keep acting and living in an awareness of the, the global dimensions of this. So, but, but England and the approach of the, the UK government is, has been slightly different and a different kind of messaging that, that comes over. Would you say that was, that was true? Is that fair Yeah, to, well, I, yeah. I dislike the way, thank you, uh, um, that, that the English government has been weaponizing uh, the, um, you know, the, the vaccination program and trying to politicize it. Uh, uh, and I think I, I would just like to stress the point that, that Linda made, um, which is that there really isn't a, a national point of view. So what we know about this virus is that it's a small, it's, it's neither really dead nor alive. It needs to get into cells to live. It's rather unstable and therefore it can mutate quite easily. And if seven and a half billion of us around the world are vaccinated and you've still got uh, for example, whether it's in Yemen or somewhere where people can't get get access, um, you have an unvaccinated population and you get an intense outbreak. What we know is that when you do get an intense outbreak, you have a much higher likelihood of mutation. And if you get a, a, a vicious mutation, then all 700, all 7 billion of us, 8 billion of us, will all have to be revaccinated. So this point that none of us are safe until all of us are safe is a, is a very important one. And it's in our interest to ensure that the vaccines, the vaccination program is rolled out around the world by whatever means are necessary. For example, releasing the, the, the rights, the control over rights so that other countries can manufacture them and so on. So I think that that's the, I, I think this is the main point where we here are privileged in that we're beginning to be able to relax and come out of it. We shouldn't politicize this. We shouldn't boast about it. Mm. And we should make every effort to make sure that the whole world gets the advantage of these amazingly good vaccination programs. Yeah, during the week there, I heard Mur Murdo Fraser, the Conservative MSP, using that kind of language of uh, the UK government having developed this world-beating vaccination programme. And I must say, I found that really distasteful, that language, that notion that we're somehow rivals and that we have to prove ourselves and do better. You know, it's in everybody's interest, as you said, that, 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 that we yes, recognise the global a, solidarity. This is a very, very uh, important point, and we'll come to it in terms of what's going on with... Uh, um, with both the independence movement and so on, which is that Brexit is a kind of breakdown. It's an Anglo, what I call Anglo-British breakdown. And 
a, a lot of foot stamping. And one of the ways in which they're trying to keep the show on the road as it crumbles, as Dominic Cummings falls out with Boris Johnson, you know, the two architects of Brexit are now at each other's throats, which is one sign of the breakdown, is by by boasting, by boosterism, by, you know, by, uh, by ensuring that everybody is with us and we're all that. And this stuff, it's, it's um, I'm afraid it's a sort of pathological condition of the Anglo-Britain at the moment. Uh, and, and you're quite right to call it out. Yeah, it's interesting yeah. To, to use the word pathology about it. Linda, can I come back to you? And just in relation to, to all of this and the language that we're using about the pandemic, what do you think will constitute the end of the emergency? Because this is a key point. Of course, it's, a, it's important for all of us, but it, it's, it has been weaponized and it has been politicized. So what, what do you think about that? Oh, gosh, I think it'll be a long time coming. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we may well get to the stage where we can uh, say we don't have a state of emergency in our own country, and that's fine. And Anthony's quite right. As, as are you, Leslie, the thought of that being politicised into, oh, aren't we great? You know, we're super. It uh, fills me with horror. Um, and it was interesting what Anthony said there about boosterism. That's an expression I haven't heard. And uh, I rather like that because it sums it up. I um, always have had a cringe within me when I hear things like best in the world or, uh, you know, first in the world and all this. And I mean, I'm saying that even though um, my own party, parliament, government has used that phraseology in, in many things, world beating, it's just something I don't like um, because I just want everybody to be getting a fair shot and, and everybody to, to be able to say that they're doing things well. So when will the state of emergency stop? Lots of signs. One of them will be when we stop seeing in the news, uh, whether it's TV, hearing in the radio or reading in the press or online, um, about rising cases in other parts of the world. Uh, note a caution here, news becomes old news and we don't hear it. So I'm, I'm talking about when it's genuine that we're not hearing it because it's not happening, not that it's just not being reported. So when it gets to the stage that it's almost like we know with the flu, well, we know that was a pandemic of its time. Uh, we know now that we have to take precautions on an annual basis to protect those who need it most. Um, so it gets to that stage, and we are still trying to develop uh, underdeveloped countries in terms of healthcare, public health. Um, that's, I think, when we can start saying that it's not an emergency anymore. Okay. Let's move on from discussing the pandemic specifically and uh, look at another news story of, of this week. The UK government has slashed its aid budget and, and claiming that this is in order to, to manage the, the extra demands financially of, of the pandemic. So we've got a reduction from a commitment of 0.7% of uh, GDP to international aid, reduced to 0.5%. And that means that uh, there's 85% cuts to the aid pledge to the United Nations Family Planning Programme. Water and sanitation uh, projects have been savagely uh, affected by this. And one area which really concerns me is uh, UK research and innovation, the projects, you know, these kind of transnational, really important humanitarian and science projects. You know, this is quite devastating and in a time of pandemic and, and Andrew Mitchell, former uh, International Development Secretary, he himself described it as a matter of national shame. Anthony, what's your take on this? Yeah, well, I, I think that I have very things to say about this. The first one is that when you were reading out the list of some of the programmes that had been cut, I didn't realise that this was what the international aid programme was doing. 
So I think one of the problems that we've got is that instead of being able to say, look, this is what we're doing, this is how, what we're achieving, uh, the cut came in because uh, the entire thing was being run in papers like The Sun and The Daily Mail as we're giving aid to China and China's got made lots of money, it doesn't need it, it's all waste. And uh, that sense that we are collectively helping others and this also helps ourselves on a, as a species has been has been lost and that's why they're being able to get away with it so obviously i think the cuts are dreadful but i also think there's a lesson there about <clears throat> if you don't advocate if you don't justify the policies properly beforehand then it's much easier for people to come in and to make these cuts so uh, i agree with what you're saying about how shocking that is and the um, there's another aspect to it because I was just reading in the Telegraph today um, that the government is planning to spend billions on in, in Scotland in order to ensure the union survives. So the, the sense that they'll spend money because they've got to keep Brexit on the road and they'll cut, you know, uh, uh, sanitation programs around the world because they think this will help keep Brexit on the road because it will feed the prejudice, not of the, not, not of the red wall, the so-called working class voters, but of the, the very right wing golf playing southern daily mail readers across the set, the leader with 60, 70% of the Brexit vote. They're feeding their base. Um, and the whole thing is just way over politicized. Yeah. Um it's a very odd way to tackle a global pandemic and yeah. claim that you're taking leadership in that to, to be, you know, making these cuts to, to really basic services like Quite. clean water yeah. and hygiene. Yeah. Linda, mm -hmm. your constituency, yeah. you know, is at the heart of this, mm -hmm. isn't it? Any... Absolutely. Uh, well, it's, it's just wrong in so many, many counts, you know, and it, it goes against all the international obligations. It, it, it goes against Tory promises of previously, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but the, the main thing is, you know, what we've all been saying is it totally contradicts the idea of dealing on a global level with things like pandemics. And when you look at the cuts to particularly women's reproductive health, etc., as you know, as well as the very basic public health things like water, it is just disastrous in, in terms of the effects that this can have. And, you know, it's interesting to hear Anthony saying, you know, that, that thing about people not really realising what the projects are. And part of that is about language. Um, I mean, I find it quite interesting that uh, the UK government, the current UK government, has started calling it aid again. You know, like this sort of a very philanthropic way uh, that the UK is helping people. Um, when it used to be called international development, before they changed mm -hmm. it back to aid, it had a whole different language context uh, because it was about developing other places to be able to grow so that they did not need aid in the future. And I think that's that's one of the things we've forgotten. Another really worrying aspect of it is, and you're right, um, what was the Department for International Development um, is in East Kilbride. Um, there are some local people work there, there are other civil servants in placement. Two things that have bothered me um, over the last couple of years is, first of all, that it was changed from the Department for International Development, rebadged outside with the union flag, and all of a sudden it's called UK Aid. Uh, but now the, the latest development is the merger of international development into UK aid, etc., and with the Foreign Office. So I'm not convinced anymore that we will be able to have the clarity of where so-called international development aid money is being spent mm. at the grassroots to help communities where they need it most. I would also say I think it's a bit of a tale of two governments. I mean, Scotland um, pays its way as we all know, well, well, we don't all know, that's the problem. Um, many of us know Scotland pays its own way uh, within the UK in terms of uh, revenues it sends to Westminster. And some of that ended on programmes run by UK aid. But in addition to that, the Scottish government 
has its own international development program mm. uh, in Malawi, uh, in India, in, in places uh, generally where Scotland has a bit of a footprint uh, in the world. And uh, I think it, it's really clear um, about the different philosophy of governments at UK level and at Scottish level. And there has been no talk of any cut in the Scottish government's dedicated budget for international development, because there is that recognition that we all have to work together uh, to make the world a better place for the benefit of us all. Uh, so I'm really concerned about, about the future and what this, this cut will do. Uh, I'm concerned about uh, a UK government that just thinks they can just decide willy-nilly because they've got this majority and to heck with everybody else and going back on promises all the time. And they're not caring. I, th I think that upsets me. You know, I, people say to me about this UK government, this Tory government, eh, do you know they just don't know what it's like to be an ordinary person? They just don't know. They just don't know. And I'm like, well, do you know what? They know fine, they just don't care. And there's a very different thing. And I think what we have is a UK government that actually doesn't care about the effects of what they do. And that's the most worrying thing of all. Yeah. Could I ask Linda, I didn't know about this. You're telling me that the, the international, the, the department was called the Department of International Development and it was rebranded mm -hmm. UK Aid. Yes. When did this yes. happen? Oh, it's a while ago now. Uh, what, two years, but, uh, five years? I don't know, maybe about two years, two I years. think. Mm, so. uh, a couple right. of years. And then it's only in the last, oh, time goes so quickly, certainly within the last year, maybe even within the last six months, Anthony, that um, there was a, a decision taken that it would be merged. Uh, yes, I know about the merger, but I didn't one. realize yeah. about the. Re it's a very important rebranding, and this is an example of what I mean by boosterism. Well, absolutely. You know, suddenly, and, something uh -huh. which is part of behaviour is suddenly given this uh, yes. uh, ultra-unionist badge. Yeah, and, and not also, just a rebranding, but also a, a very upfront campaign through schools, churches and everything else to be saying, look at the wonderful things aid are doing. Yeah, and they're using... Yeah. Uh, you know, using Westminster uh, in lots of ways in Scotland uh, to right. say, look what the UK government is doing. And the hidden implication Un of that is, a subliminal implication, is that it wouldn't happen if we weren't doing it. Yeah. So it's all part of the plan. You know, this, this perhaps sounds like the kind of pathological approach to government that Anthony's already been talking about. And... Uh, when we look over the Atlantic, maybe we sigh a, a great sigh of relief that uh, we no longer have to deal and listen to Trump's uh, mad ravings day in, day out. And we, Joe Biden, President Joe Biden, uh, perhaps has shown himself not to be as sleepy as people were, were thinking he might be. Uh, he, he's... Uh, We've heard his address after his first 100 days as president, um, and he's he's done some very bold things. Anthony, uh, are you hopeful about the direction of travel that we're seeing with with the Biden presidency? Uh, yes, I, I think it's a, a very very um, important development, and I've been writing. I am writing about this, and I've been working on it, and I think it's a. a um, you know, how can I put this? I think hopeful is not quite the right uh, word for it. Um, what's happening in, in the United States is absolutely of world importance. And I also think that what's going on in terms of the whole independence argument in Scotland is sort of related to this because it's a question of how do we defeat Trumpism? And Trumpism is not dead yet in America. So at the moment, there's a concerted effort by the Republican states that, that run Texas and other states like that, where they're in control of the state executive, to organize voter suppression. And if they succeed in doing that, and they succeed in their gerrymandering, then they could well win a congressional majority, in, in the, even in the House and in the Senate 
in in twenty in the midterm elections in twenty twenty two, and completely frustrate the Biden program. So one of the things that's driving the radicalism and the far-reaching extent of what um, Biden is doing is fear that the Trumpites will get back. And they've got to create a sense of momentum, which becomes in its own way irreversible, and to win American support for it. And this means that the policies, the economic policies, the vaccine policies, the, the recovery from COVID, the infrastructure is not just as they're positioning it as being in competition with China, um, but it's also in competition with Trumpism. And that, that I, I, so I feel enormous solidarity with what they're trying to achieve. And I, I think their attempt to reconstruct American global hegemony is is a very is a dubious matter, but we can come to that later. But what they're doing is very very dramatic. It's very important. We should all be supporting it. And what's particularly important is that it won't succeed unless they can integrate democratic reform in the United States with this political economic program. So, I mean, to get the simple example, Biden had the seven million majority in the presidential election in terms of the popular vote, but he won in three key states by a total of 43,000. So when Trump says he, Trump really said that the election was stolen, he's not talking about the election. He's talking about how technically they could have swung Michigan and, and, and Georgia and the, these very narrow votes. And that's why the voter suppression in a small number of American states can have a devastating impact in terms of the return of Trumpism. Yeah, Linda, you're nodding. Mm. Do you agree with uh, Anthony's analysis of the situation and, and the challenges? Well, I think I probably do, but I'm going to have to listen to it all again and, <laughs> and think it through and consider everything that Anthony has said, because I found that really interesting. And uh, it's something I, I will look at further. Um, I'm a much more on, on a, a surface level of, of what's happening with Biden. Uh, there is, for me, uh, just a joy that Trump's away for a start. Um, couldn't have had any, any better uh, happening for the US and the rest of us where we are just now. You know, the way that he upped the vaccination programme, took things on board, um, the way that he is looking at social reform and very quickly within that first 100 days uh, doing things, uh, I think is wonderful. But I don't think we should forget the role that Kamala Harris has in this as well, because I think it's more than just Biden as president of the US. I think there's a partnership going on there uh, with him and his vice president, Kamala Harris. And uh, one of the things that I, I really do believe is that um, what you have there now is a bit of decency. There's a team there that is decent and genuinely wants to do the best uh, for the country. And yes, they will make mistakes. Of course they will. Uh, everyone does. But I think uh, the first 100 days, and I haven't done a full analysis of the potential effects of the economic policies within that 100 days. I know there's discussion about it. But just the fact that they're doing decent things and the right things, as far as I can see it, just fills me with great hope uh, for the US. So onward and upward, as far as I'm concerned there. Yeah, yeah. Th there remains that underlying concern about uh, the, the shape and the health of democracy, not just in America, mm -hmm. but, but all over yeah, the everywhere. world in many places. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we've seen the, 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 the really dire consequences when, yeah. when, you know, Trumpism takes on its own form. And, in, and the point the that I agree, and the point that Linda makes about, about um, Kamala Harris, I, 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 I agree with that entirely. Biden will succeed insofar as he is a popular alliance, an alliance of good mm. people from, and that's where, to take a simple example, he's very different from Starmer. Starmer is closing down yes. his alliance to the left. He's talking with people I, like Mandelson and so on, who are saying, rerun new labor, push the left out. Uh, whereas when Biden launched his, uh, the American Renewal, the $1.9 trillion program, he thanked Bernie Sardinus twice for bringing in the votes and for his characterization of what it was about. So 
So Biden represents a conscious effort, and Kamala Harris is part of that, to widen mm. the alliance of government if we're going yeah. to get decent and good government going and not to narrow it. Yeah, that's a very important strategic approach, isn't it, to, to kind of building that coalition, that, that broad base of support to challenge and to confront and to uh, you yeah. know, overcome Trumpism in all, in all its forms. And I, I wonder, you know, you, you, you've already said, Anthony, that you think this is something that is really pertinent to what's going on here in Scotland. And we're moving into the, the final few days of our election campaign here for the Scottish Parliament. Um, and and it, there, there is a kind of feel of, you know, this is a really key turning point and a key moment in, in Scottish democracy in the, in the context of the, the, the union, the, the, the whole of the UK. And, and yet, for me, just kind of thinking back on the, the, the campaign thus far, it has been rather flat. There hasn't been, you know, and I wonder why that is. Um, I'm, I'm going to come back to Anthony about this. You know, what's, yeah. what, what do you think is going, going on here? Do you want me to? Yes, uh -huh. I'd like to. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I'm not, I, I, I think I'd rather Linda went first about okay. the flatness of the campaign. <laughs> I've got some very definite reflections on, on its importance. Okay. But I, uh, I, I ha I'm not in, in Scotland, alas. And uh, so I, I'm not really up on the what is happening. It's, I'm very struck by what's going on in the yeah. campaign and trying to understand it. So I'd rather listen to what Linda had first before I Absolutely, I that's very that, enough. Right. I, su I suppose my point was that, you know, in the midst of it, it doesn't feel like, yes. you know, there's major, major debates happening right. about, you know, the well, future, about the shape of democracy. And yet, the, yes, you I, know, these are key constitutional and other well, questions. Well, I think the problem, so, I think the real problem here, if I can put it like this, is that um, Brexit is, is, is a breakdown. It's not, it, and, and if I could give you a, a, a small example of this. So where, during the, um, the, 19, nine, the 2019 election, the, the election which, where Bo gave Boris Johnson his majority, uh, there was a house around the corner from where I live and the top half of the house had a big banner saying, leave means leave. And there was a union jack in the front garden. Now, this phrase, leave means leave, let's get Brexit done, which has obsessed now the sort of what I call the Anglo-British. You have to think about it. Like if you went into a bar or you went into a crowded restaurant or something and you were with some companions and one of them said, let's leave. The natural question is, well, where do we go? What, what your place, my place to be? Go to another. And if they said, leave means leave, don't ask me about that project fear you'd say oh dear uh, uh, well what's what's gone wrong with with him or her you know you've got you, you'd have somebody with a bit of a problem and we all have problems i mean it's not it's perfectly human but it just there's something going wrong and and in effect the answer to this is that the anglo-british never really believed that they joined the european union they didn't realize that creating the single market was a journey that, some, that they had, we have gone somewhere else. They just thought they were getting rid of the EU and everything would remain the same. And they had a political class, I'm afraid to say, on both the Remain side, Cameron, Mandelson, who ran the um, Remain campaign, and on the Leave side, Brexit, so Johnson, Farage, who weren't willing to talk about Nobody, or well, some of us tried, Caroline Lucas tried, but nobody really was willing to talk, to face up to how we had changed. I think Scotland understands, because Scotland, if I can put it this way, is used to being a nation inside a larger union. Scotland understood that this larger union was, was beneficial for it as being part of Scotland. And the English haven't understood this. So we're on a project of extraction and what the 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 anglo-british are doing is they're saying to you um they're bullying and they're bullying 
because they want to input, they want to extract the whole of the union from its connection to its continent and really from the, the way the world is going. And they might have won if it hadn't been for coronavirus. The coronavirus it was the key factor in defeating Trump because it demanded good government. Mm -hmm. And Trump, as we Johnson, hated government. And that the catastrophe of Trump's inability to deal with, with the virus is the thing that tipped the election in the United States. And now that we don't have Trump in the White House, now that the alliance of Johnson, Trump, Putin, Xi, Erdogan, the alliance of sort of what, what people call the Iron Men is no more, uh, Brexit is bound to fail. And you as a country, Scotland, are hitched to this failure. And what we, uh, I think here in England, should be doing is saying to you, please do everything you can to rejoin the European Union. <laughs> this is not about building more walls. This is about solidarity, about living with other people. And that will be the fastest way in which the English can face up to our reality, put Brexit behind us, and rejoin you inside the larger European Union. And I think in a way, a certain way, Britishness, I understand that there are many Scots who don't, who, you know, they, they resist the idea of independence in the sense that, well, you know, Scotland's done very well as part of a union. It doesn't want to just go off into the world on its own. And what's important about what we've done in terms of Europe for Scotland is to say, no, look, we as Europeans, many of us in England, many of us across every country in the European Union, want Scotland to, uh, to rejoin. And so what we've done, if I could put it this way, so I'm running forward, is we've thought not just, we haven't just written a letter to the heads of the European nations saying, please be generous to Scotland, show solidarity, do it now, but we want everybody to sign it. And we think it's really important if people in Scotland sign this, join this appeal, and then ask their friends and relatives around the world to join it, this could shift, it can reshape the narrative, reshape the way in which Europe itself thinks about what's going on in Scotland. And this is this and I think that's this is what is at stake in in, in this election. Obviously, if uh, you don't have a majority in Parliament which wants to have independence, then this argument becomes much weaker and it will be a victory for Trumpism. Yeah, okay. And you, you mentioned there that Trumpism was defeated really through the pandemic and the, the, the need to, to demonstrate good, competent leadership. And I guess um, here in Scotland, that's, that's been one of the, the the, the key messages that, that Nicola Sturgeon and her government have been uh, promoting, you know, that they are safe pair of hands. You know, today, uh, Nicola Sturgeon has, has uh, stated again, you know, just how important that is and that that's what people are voting for and that's why they, they need to give both their votes to the SNP. <laughs> and uh, the latest poll that, that's in today's Herald uh, does suggest that the SNP will win that majority um, and you know, with, with a bit of a swing from from both the, the main unionist parties. Um, and it's also demonstrating that, that, according to this poll, you know, the pandemic is clearly the priority and dealing with the pandemic and, and dealing with that recovery. But it is interesting to hear all of that put into this kind of broader European uh, perspective and also where we're going democratically uh, in a world which not only has a pandemic to deal with, but this climate emergency, which threatens us all. Quite. So, um, Linda, now I'm going to put you on the spot and say, so where are we in Scotland with all of that? <laughs> oh, gosh, the thing is, Leslie, it's all linked. It's absolutely yeah. all linked. You know, um, the, the political discourse at time of elections uh, is such that everything's in its own wee box. So you get that you can't possibly have a referendum because you have to deal with the pandemic. Uh, you can't possibly think about tearing Scotland out of the UK Union. Look how difficult it's been to 
uh, for the UK to leave the European Union. And everything's looked at in its own wee bit, but they are all linked. Um, of course, the first priority has got to be getting on top of the pandemic um, and getting us through that uh, public health emergency. Of course it has. But we also have to think about where we go from that. And uh, I mean, certainly um, the time of the pandemic here in Scotland has crystallised for many, many of us things that we already knew, which is the great disparity um, of income, of well-being, of health. And if we really want to be saying this isn't acceptable anymore, uh, we need to forge a better path for, for the people in this country to move forward. It has to be healthier. It has to be fairer. Well, you know, it can be done when you've got Boris Johnson and his pals running the show at the UK and therefore in charge of Scotland and the big things that Scotland needs to make a difference. So for me, independence is inextricably linked with coming through the pandemic out the other end and having forged a better society at the end of it. So you can't look at all these things in isolation. It's all got to be part. Um, yes, uh, to, to force a referendum issue, which is democratic. I mean, the, the posturing that's going on about you will not be allowed uh, to have your say is against all the international norms. It, it, it's just completely ridiculous. The latest nonsense from uh, some of the Scottish Tories about the UK should be putting legislation in place to stop us. You know, all of a sudden they want uh, Scotland in the same position as happened with Catalonia because of um, Spanish government intransigence. It, it's just ludicrous to call yourselves Democrats and then talk that way. So. I see these things all together. Of course, I think the pandemic is a public health issue that we have to get to grips with most of all. But in order to make us a better society in Scotland, we have to forge our own path and we are more than capable of doing it. And for me, part of that path is re-entry into the European Union. And that is all part of the bigger picture as well. Uh, and that sort of precede some of the things that Anthony said about the effect that would perhaps have on the rest of the UK, which I think is very, very important as well. Because let's face it, England's our neighbours, you know. We have historic links that go way, way back. Um, and we really should be working together in some of this stuff and forging out the best for all our people. Okay, Linda, so... Yeah. That's the case that we we're, we have the recovery, and it's linked with these broader questions of uh, of equality and well being, and care, and a, a, an economy that is based and rooted in care. Um, so there there are lots of big questions. You, the United Kingdom government has been talking about um, how. We can't have that referendum. We can't, you know, be in the position to make that choice until we come out of the pandemic, until we're, we're past the emergency. And that does, you know, that raises a lot of questions about the politicisation of the pandemic and what constitutes a recovery and what are the resources and tools that we need to, to make an effective recovery. And I, I guess that's the, the kind of argument that, that, that the SNP and, and those who support independence would, would be making. Um, but back to, back to Anthony um, yeah. and, and, and the question of Europe and Brexit and, and, and the way in which uh, Brexit has really shifted this whole question. And uh, could just, just tell us a bit more about... Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I think... The, the yes, I, I, and I think this argument, you know, that, oh, you can't have it now, right? And, I mean... On the one hand, they're saying to us, look, we've solved it. Look at our world beating a vaccination uh, uh, program. The, the, the pandemic is over. And then they're suddenly saying, on the other hand, to Scotland, oh, you know, you, must, you can't afford to. Uh, uh, the pandemic's not over. It's a grave, grave emergency, which is going to go on for years and years and years. So they're, they're, they're just trying to have it in, in every way they can. And, and I think that... Um, I have moments where I've thought that for, for Boris Johnson and certainly for Michael Gove, the question of how you defeat Scotland, how you whip Scotland down, how you keep the union is more important for them than how they solve the pandemic. 
this is what they they think about because if Scotland goes its own way and rejoins Europe, and remember it was it voted by a very large majority to remain, it's being taken out against its will from the European Union. Uh, if they don't succeed in doing this, then Bre Brexit will fail. I mean, the ideological aspect of Brexit, the sense that we are world beaters and Great Britain and so on, uh, hinges. Uh, this is a sign of how it is itself a, a fantastical project on whether they can keep Scotland, which is a relatively small part of the UK, in the UK. Um, and so they're going to use anything they can. And, and, and I think this point of um, imposing of what you might call ultra unions is very important. And there was an article in Conservative Home by one of these very strong pro-Brexit figures. Uh, Henry Hill, who actually described the flag, the country's flag, as our national flag. Now, it's a union, Jack, it's not a national flag, it's a union flag. That's the name. The name is, is a uh, recognition of our multinational status. And they're saying, no, we're one nation. We're going to spend our money in Scotland. What is this? So the, the, and, and that is a function of Brexit. And Brexit itself is, the, is, the, is, is what is doing the damage here. And I think it's very important when you look at this to say, hold on a second. It's not Scotland leaving the UK, disrupting things. It's Scotland trying to return mm -hmm. to having a natural relationship with this continent. I've got many criticisms where the European Union works. Uh, but let's have it, you know, let's, this is our continent. We should be part of that argument. And, and so it, oddly enough, it's quite a conservative thing to do, to say we need to have a government. We, we in England need a government in Scotland that will take you back. And of course, it has the democratic right to do so. And, and I call on, if there are English people watching this, uh, uh, everybody in England should be supporting this. And I emphasize again there's a small way in which we can do this which is to sign europe for scotland go to europe for scotland on the web there's a website and on that website you can sign up your support for what we're doing and i think it's very important that europe stands up and says yes we want this reaches out its hand and and i think it's important in scotland as well if i may say that so that you it's not just simply saying we should be part of the European Union, but um, you, a small country, perhaps no country, can be independent on its own. Independence is a relationship to the rest of the world. And the expression of solidarity is a crucial part of any independence movement. You know, I think it was your Baron, who was Scottish, who gave critical support to the Greeks in their fight for independence. Uh, uh, in the 1820s and um, you know this this is there's a very long and a proud Scottish tradition of this and I think you should be full-hearted in calling on the world to support what you are trying to support your democratic right indeed and you know I'm quite interested that you're talking about the the UK government as 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 unionists and as you know f wanting to flag everything with the national union jack it, it, it strikes me that they're that they're actually they're actually undermining the the the, the, the traditional notion of the union mm -hmm. which is a partnership of nations uh, a, a partnership by a, a voluntary partnership and the point that, that Kieran Martin made in his very impressive address a couple of weeks ago and paper right. you know that, that we're now that, that the road that the the government is going down now is really towards you know by force of law and and that you know raises the specter of Catalonia and so on mm -hmm. so Linda I'm you know how do you respond to the Europe for Scotland initiative and uh, this call for solidarity you know and and drawing on our own traditions our long history of of being seeing ourselves as Europeans. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think it's great. I, I was delighted at this initiative. 
uh, as I have been delighted to see so many um, people within the European Union, you know, prominent people within the European Union from officer level as well as elected level, uh, saying that Scotland would be very welcome and some going as far as to say we'd be fast tracked, which is what we've always believed because we already have convergence in so many things by dint of having been a, a member through the UK for so many years. So yeah, it's super. And uh, you know, also, you know, this thing about this rebranding, the UK stuff and, you know, the One Nation Britain, Great Britain and all, all that terrible legacy that, that that brings into my head um, is, I find it quite desperate, to be honest. And uh, I'm not convinced that the population generally will buy it. I think those who have been awakened to the idea of independence for Scotland uh, won't buy any of it. Uh, I think there's, you know, still and legitimately a, a hard core of people who wish to uh, to stay within the UK. Uh, that's their view. So again, it's, it's about looking at the don't knows, the people in the middle, and how they have to be swayed. Um, I, I believe Scotland is a an intelligent uh, voting population who will look at these things and when the time comes, when we're having that referendum, we'll look at all the arguments and make the decision. But I'm finding the stuff uh, that you are coming out with Project Fear again uh, that, that we had before, you know, all the stuff about the international community will not recognise Scotland, but da 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 uh, I'll tell you what, the international community would be quite horrified at the idea that within a so-called democracy of a voluntary partnership of nations, a large nation is saying to the smaller one, no, you're not allowed to make up your own mind about what you want to do, and we are not letting you uh, have a referendum. It's completely ridiculous under international norms these days. And it's the kind of thing that so many people um, across the parties within the UK across the parties, across the administrations, have fought for the right of other people. Uh, in fact, there's a, a fairly prominent Conservative, who I, I won't name uh, within the UK, that I've had quite a few discussions with about this, uh, who is very, very supportive of the Catalan cause mm -hmm. and thinks it absolutely appalling that the Spanish government uh, are behaving the way they are in reference to Catalonia. Yet his own party is on the road of uh, behaving the same way towards Scotland and probably Wales when it comes to it. So there's so many contradictions there. Yeah. And it does seem, it does really seem like a very retro uh, uh, kind I think of there's something else that... going on which I'd like, I'd like to share with you and you could tell me whether I'm right or wrong, which is that it seems to me that what happened in the, well, I went to Scotland for the 2014 referendum. It seemed to me that what happened there was that Gordon Brown in particular persuaded the uh, the leaders of the main political parties, um, Clegg, oh. and Miliband and um, Cameron, to sign the vow. And the vow <laughs> committed, uh, uh, it committed the United Kingdom to saying that the Scottish Parliament would be, was, you know, it was irreversible. And it pushed the UK towards more of a kind of, in a federal direction which is what Gordon Brown has been arguing for as the, quote, the solution to uh, the question of, of providing a much greater degree of autonomy and self-government to Scotland. And they did deliver in terms of legislation, the, the Cameron government, mm. uh, to, try and, to try and fulfill that, right? Limited though it was. Now, what's happening now is that all that effort at at federalization is being reversed. Gordon Brown's project for a, 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 a democratic Britain, which would be a, a sufficiently encompassing and generous for Scotland to feel at home in, has been destroyed, wrecked by Brexit, it seems to me. And the mm. dynamic of Brexit, and remember Brexit's only just beginning, we can see it at work in Northern Ireland, but even Eileen Foster is not regarded as sufficiently right-wing enough to be to be the uh, first minister there. Uh, um, this is this is they are proceeding. They are proceeding in a hard-hearted fashion to seek to impose 
a, that's why I was talking about the national flag. Mm -hmm. They're going to sort of, they're taking the funds that were European funds that went to the Scottish government will now be spent directly. They will brand those funds in Scotland. They're not worrying about development aid, but they'll put as much money, they'll buy, if they can buy Scotland mm -hmm. to stay in the union at any cost, they will. And you, so you're up against uh, that, that, if you like, an attempt at a democratic project has, has collapsed. Mm. And I feel that the swing of opinion in Scotland is partly represented by those who felt, this is what I'm asking, like <laughs> Gordon Brown, okay, you know, if, if we can get a reasonable relationship, a better relationship, a healthy build on the, 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 the co collaboration of nations, then we will stay at home in the United Kingdom. And that's what Brexit is now putting into reverse. And that's why I feel, this is my question, there's a shift of opinion in Scotland to say, well, we're used to being a country in a larger union and the welcoming larger union is now Europe and not the UK. Well, I think <laughs> do you have a whole other programme, Liz? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> um, in you know, in, I, in I, a minute. I, I, <laughs> I see where Anthony's come from that, uh, but I think we start from very different positions. Uh, I don't think there was any genuine intent of Gordon Brown whatsoever with the vow. It was about complete and utter panic that Scotland was going to vote yes, so they said anything that they thought would stop that happening. Uh, I then sat in the Smith Commission and to watch the behaviour about what was possible with other parties. No, there was nothing of genuine intent in any of that. So I'm not surprised where we've ended up. Yes, Brexit is a, a different thing that has come in and that has affected people's thinking, but there was never any intent of federalism. It comes up, as does the more powers argue, argument, every single time it looks like independence is going to be a goer. Uh, so, as I say, a whole other programme to discuss this and the, and whether federalism is in fact sure, possible. But, but, uh, okay, okay, but my question, a a fair, I, I heard, I've heard what you said, my question is, do you think that part of the shift of opinion that's now happening in Scotland is from those who maybe they you disagree with them, uh, uh, who did feel there was something in what people like Brown were arguing and have now said, okay, in that case, given Brexit, the answer for a, a federal outcome is to be part of the European Union, i.e. through independence. There, there has been a shift of opinion since 2014, and it's not just a generational one, and and so my question is whether that's that. What do you feel about that? I, can, I think that been, <laughs> Linda, I'm can I ask that question? To, you, you can ask that question, and we, we don't really have time for for you know a fully considered <laughs> answer. <laughs> um, yeah. It, Anyway, there was something I wanted to Scotland. say and sign I've forgotten the, it now. You know, but uh, Linda, respond as quickly as you can to, to Anthony's. Uh, uh, Anthony is much more gracious than me. He gives nice and tense. Uh, I don't give nice and tense at all. And, and I think the shift in people is that they've seen right through it uh, rather than a longing for something that might have been. They've seen the charade. Right. Yeah, thanks. I, I, okay, I mean, just clear. today, in today's uh, Sunday Telegraph, uh, there's you know, a, a, a long report about the, the strategy, the, the so-called strategy, yeah. the just say no strategy. And somebody, is, a, a government insider is quoted as saying the government is up for a bare knuckle fight. And, oh. you know, that's, that's kind of how, the, speaking personally, that's how it Terrible feels plans. here, you know. And, and so there is no chance, no chance, and this is my response briefly to Anthony, there is no chance that people will imagine that any, any kind of positive federal, you know, broader recognition of this partnership could, could really emerge from the current political right. situation. But I have all to the wind more reason, up all, now. Yes, <laughs> all the more reason to, for everybody to sign Europe for Scotland and to try and make sure that the, we change the narrative in a positive <laughs> yeah, yeah. way. Well, that, that's an, a really important point to, to conclude on. Thank um, you. Anthony, I meant to mention at the start of the programme that, that you have uh, written an introduction to a new edition of Tom Nairn's uh, classic groundbreaking book, The Breakup of Britain. Uh, so I, I wonder if right. that's where we're at now, The Breakup of Britain, but it'll be 
very interesting to to see where Tom is at now that, with that's that. That's what I. That's that. Yes. Yeah. Tom is a and great man. He's a, a good friend, and that's he, what we argue. Yeah. He is indeed. He's a. He's he's been a, a very significant figure in this debate over many years. But thank you to both of you, to to Linda Fabiani and to uh, Anthony Barnett. Thanks very much for joining me for thank this you. discussion this afternoon. Thank you. And uh, just before we wind up, I just want to remind anyone who's watching that uh, Broadcasting Scotland is expanding. If you think this is an important uh, service, uh, you know, to have this kind of independent, people-led uh, broadcasting service, then, then please do consider contributing and supporting Broadcasting Scotland. You can find all the details there. So thanks very much, everybody, and good afternoon. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.